Right, thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, I am Ravi. I work at uh, Google in, in, in Mountain View, uh, California. So first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it looks like a great workshop, uh, but I also want to apologize for not being able to attend. So it turns out that this week we have some internal event at Google where, uh, in research at Google, where all of us are expected to uh, show up. So that's the reason why Andrew is not able to attend as well. Okay. So today's talk is going to be on random walks and graph properties. Uh, this is some a body of work that I have been working for the last few years with my colleagues. And uh, the way it's connected to the topic of the workshop is that we all know PageRank is inspired by a random surfer. And the point I'm trying to make is that random walks can do can go much beyond just estimating page rank or uh, giving a score for every node. So random walks are very powerful objects and can be used for a variety of statistical purposes. And that's the aim of this talk. So I prepared the talk for about 50 minutes so that you all can go home early. So if I, uh, um, if I finish a little bit uh, uh, late, I apologize in advance. Okay. So uh, this, as I said, is joint work with a lot of my colleagues, with the Flavio, Anirban, uh, Silvio, and Tamash. And uh, this work appeared over a series of papers, some at WWDAB, some at KDD, and some at Wisdom. So I will not go into the exact citations, but at the end of the talk, I'll put up my email and you can uh, ask me if you have any questions about any specific uh, topics. Okay. So what is the problem that we're looking at? So it's very simple. So we are given a graph and the goal is to estimate its basic parameters. So what do we mean by basic parameters? Let's say how many nodes, how many nodes does the graph have? Or how many edges does it have? Or you can go one step further and ask, what are the fraction of nodes or edges of a certain type? Or you can ask, what is the largest or average degree of the graph? And you can even make it even more complicated by asking stuff about clustering coefficients or higher order objects like triangles. So that's the basic problem we are looking at. So you want, you're given a graph and you want to know its basic parameters, like what are the properties it has. Okay, so why, why is such a question interesting? Why is it useful? So I'd like to claim there are two main use cases for that. The first is business intelligence. I would like to know, uh, if I own a social network, I would like to know how many art lovers are there in a particular social network. Let's take Facebook. And as a person outside Facebook, I would like to know how many people who love art are present in the social network. So that's like calculating the fraction of nodes in the social network that have expressed some love for art. And another business intelligence reason is if, I, if there are two social networks, say uh, Facebook and Twitter, they would like to know, one of them would like to know how well is the other one connected in a particular region say in uh, is X social network in Paris as well connected as it of Y. So for business intelligence reasons where I don't have full access to the social network, I would like to ask some questions about that. The second reason is algorithmic, uh, just algorithmic curiosity. So a typical question is, is the triangle density, the number of triangles present in a particular region, unusually small in certain portions of the graph? So that's useful because we all know that the number of triangles is a good indicator of the health of a social network. So if a, a particular section of the graph has very few triangles than you would typically expect, then it gives us some indication that it's that portion of the graph is not doing that well. So maybe you can take some corrective actions. And then another example of a question is, how does the graph's degree, average degree, vary over time? So we, know, we all know these graphs uh, change over time. They don't remain static. And the question is, how does the average degree, how does the connectivity change over time? In fact, one of the problems that uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, later arose out of uh, this kind of business intelligence type questions. I'll come to that uh, when we talk about it. Okay. So now that we have kind of motivated why looking at graphs and understanding its properties are important. And now we turn to what are the tools that are available to study such things. So the main, the big tool that's available for us is sampling. 
So sampling is a critical and important tool to understand large graphs. And the focus of this work is going to study such graph properties using samples. In fact, this turns out to be the only realistic option in many situations. So think of, say, I as an individual would like to understand the graph structure of Twitter, Twitter's graph network. Of course, Twitter is not going to allow me to, or not going to give me the entire graph, or it's in fact, it's going to put restrictions on how many times I can ask the network as about connectivity. So it's not that I have the entire graph at my disposal. I need to make queries to Twitter's uh, database to get all the nodes and the edges. So in, in this setting, the only realistic option I have is to sample Twitter's graph in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nice way, such that I can make inferences. And the second reason why sampling is the only method is that there is no graph actually. The graph keeps changing. There's no fixed graph. Uh, even like taking Twitter as an example, we all know that there are uh, thousands or tens of thousands of people join or leave the network on a daily basis. So there is no fixed graph where I can really run my algorithms. The graph keeps constantly changing. And therefore, there is already randomness built into the uh, underlying data, underlying object. And so sampling is one way to mitigate uh, against this randomness, actually. And another important uh, reason why we use sampling is that sampling can give rise to provably good algorithms. In fact, if you can say something about the quality of samples, how good the samples are, or how representative, or how statistically unbiased or independent the samples are, that directly impacts the quality of the output. So it's important to have provably good algorithms for sampling. And that's the paradigm we'll carry in this talk. OK. But sampling is not a new problem that we are looking at. In fact, sampling has a very, very long history. Uh, so sampling can be traced all the way back to the World War, where there is a famous problem called a uh, German tank problem. I don't know how many of you know about it. So the problem is actually very, very nice, very, very elegant problem. So in, in the World War, German tanks were, uh, tanks were produced by Germany with uh, um, sequential serial numbers, and some of them were captured by the uh, uh, Allied forces. And the question was, uh, and every tank had an ID, which was like sequentially uh, generated when the tank was produced. And the question is, by looking at the IDs of the tanks I capture, is it possible to guesstimate how many tanks the, uh, uh, the opponent forces have? That's the question. And there are various ways of looking at it, you know, depending on what kind of modeling you do, whether you're a frequentist or a, whether you're a Bayesian person, you can come up with various statistical estimates. But this notion of looking at samples and making inferences about the whole underlying um, uh, data objects is, is very old. And the whole uh, field of statistics is somewhat de devoted to this, uh, to this question. And coming to uh, uh, in making inferences from sampling, there are, uh, even to date, there are a lot of applications in fields like ecology that rely on sampling. For example, I want to count the number of uh, birds in a particular region. And how would uh, ecologists do that? They'll go on day one, and they'll catch a bunch of birds and tag them uh, with some tag. And then they'll come back the next day and see what, again, catch a bunch of birds and see what fraction of them have the tag. And under some very simple assumptions that the distributions are, uh, they don't change much, you can write down the equations for estimating the number of uh, birds by using these two uh, estimators on two different uh, days. And this is the uh, Peterson Lincoln Chapman index that's used in um, ecology, it's used in, even to date in like multiple fields where one cannot really have full access to the data. Another, uh, another kind of uh, sampling is done to estimate. Um, uh, subpopulation. I want to know all the people, as I said, like all the people in a network or in, in a community that are interested in, say, tennis. Okay, So if you're looking at a subpopulation, a population with a very specific property, you can use samples, you can use samples to infer that. Okay. So the, the kind of places where sampling turns out to be very, very important and useful is when the underlying population is too large or it's too difficult to have direct access to. The bird example is one thing. There's no way that I can go to any, any area and catch all the birds and count them, or you know, counting any number, any, any animals in any, any region. Or the same thing can be said about uh, uh, social networks as well. There's no way I'm able to 
go and access Twitter's network and count the number of users there. And sampling has turned out to be extremely useful in multiple areas, including, um, including things like uh, statistics, computer science, sociology, econ economics, and so on. Uh, for example, every two years in the US, uh, we rely on polling to estimate people's political leaning and preferences and who's going to win and so on. And every 10 years, you, uh, recently, US has been resorting to sample to uh, do test census, like estimating average income, education level, uh, uh, the racial distribution, and things like that. So sampling is, uh, is present everywhere throughout all the, uh, 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 So somebody is asking for slides. Should I send the slides or should I uh, continue talking? Oh. Oh. I see. Okay. So hold on one second. Let me. Uh, I don't know why the. I thought I was sharing it actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Somehow I thought I was sharing the screen. Is it okay now? Okay, sorry. You know, I, so I was assuming that you only see the source slides, not me. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, so okay. So as I said, the 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 uh, uh, yeah. Okay. The so sampling is, is a very important paradigm, and uh, it's is very important when population is too large or uh, uh, it's in, in, in inaccessible. Actually. Okay. So now that I have motivated sampling. I can actually go to the specific problem that we, we will discuss, which is sampling in graphs. So how do you sample things in graphs? Yeah. Okay. So, so to be able to study sampling, the, uh, the most important thing is how do you assume things about the graph? What is the graph access model? So what, what sort of things are available to touch the graph? And once I touch the graph, what information that comes back from the underlying system? So here is a very simple assumption. So we assume that you can query any node by its name and get its out neighborhood. That means I can crawl somebody's homepage and get all the links that come out of the homepage, the web page. Or I can go to somebody's say, Twitter account and get all the uh, uh, followers or uh, uh, people they follow from that account. So it's a very, very natural assumption. No, it's just enabled by crawling, actually. So if you go and uh, write a standard crawler that goes around, crawls all the web pages, you have this assumption baked in. And this is true for both web and social networks. So this is a very uh, standard assumption. In fact, uh, things like page rank are built on this assumption. You go, you're able to go to a web page and get all the uh, out neighbors of the web page. And the second assumption that you'd like to make is that a very small number of truly uniform nodes that are available to the algorithm. So notice that truly uniform nodes are really expensive. You know, how do I get a truly uniform uh, Facebook user? I have no idea. You know? Or how do I get a truly uniform web page? That's even trickier. Because as I said, the graph is changing. And so we really have to make a lot of assumptions as to be able to lay our hands on a, a really uniform node in the graph. And the another reason why we like this graph access model is that this model supports random walks. As I said, this is the classic model used in, say, PageRank or other uh, graph access uh, algorithms. And therefore, in particular, random walks satisfy this property. Because once I get a node and I take and I get all its out neighbors, I can clearly pick one uniformly among them and then do my continue my random walk. Okay. On the other hand, even though this model is very simple and uh, elegant, Querying inherently, it's an expensive operation because every time I touch the graph, I incur some cost, be it time or resources or even limitations. Uh, Twitter, for example, will not let me query their graph, say, more than 10,000 times a day. There is a limit they would like to put on how frequently I touch their graph. And therefore, any algorithm we develop on this under this model has to perform as few queries as possible. And that's the goal of the algorithm, should minimize the number of queries. Okay. So now that I have motivated sampling in general and how we are able to access this graph, the kind of assumptions we make on this graph, I would like to go to the uh, actual problem that we'll, we'll look at next. 
So here is a simple problem. You are given an undirected connected graph. Uh, let n be the number of nodes and m be the number of edges. And as I said before, you don't have the entire graph accessible to you. And you are prescribed a distribution on the nodes. So let d be some distribution on the nodes of the graph. The problem is using this graph access model, you want to output a node in the graph picked according to the given distribution B. Of course, you would like, I mean, you would you would never get exact answers. So you're allowed some small amount of slack, say within like plus minus epsilon additive error. And you want this algorithm to perform as few accesses to this graph as possible. The distribution is very general. Now I'm uh, stating a very general problem. I haven't told you exactly what the distribution is, but this is the abstract problem. So we are given a distribution and you would like to design a process that outputs a node according to this distribution using a random walk like model. That's the abstract problem that we are looking at. Okay, so why is this interesting? Here is a very easy case. Suppose the given the prescribed distribution is actually proportional to the degree of a node. Uh, for reasons that will come obvious later, let me call the distribution D1. So D1 of V, a node V, is proportional to its degree, the degree of V. Okay? It's the uh, uniform edge case. I want to basically output a node in the graph proportional to its degree. So the solution here is very simple. You know, this, this workshop uh, is uh, appropriate for that. So you, you just do a uniform random walk on the graph, and that we know once a uh, uh, random walk reaches its limiting distribution, then the solution is D1, which is the uh, degree of the node. So the limiting distribution of the walk is D1, and the number of times you need to do this walk until this limiting distribution is achieved is exactly the what is called the mixing time of the graph. So basically the uh, length of the random walk that I need to run in order that uh, the, the node I output at the end is chosen according to distribution D1. So it's a very, very easy case. So let's look at a slightly more, in my opinion, more interesting case. What if I want to output a node uniform at random? So let me call the distribution D0. Okay. So D0 of V is 1 over N, where N is the number of nodes. So I want to pick a node in the graph uniform at random from all the nodes. So what will be the, uh, how would I do this uh, using random walks? Okay. So here is first idea. The very natural idea that comes to, like, say, computer scientists. So it's called rejection sampling. So the paradigm is generate and reject. So I'll conduct a uniform random walk for, say, t mix steps. So I'll continue the random walk until the walk mixes. And suppose at the end of this random walk, I reached a node called u. What I do is reject. With probability proportional to 1 over the degree of u, you output u and stop. Otherwise, you go back to the first step and restart the walk all over again. And why is this 1 over d of u? So it totally makes sense that if the node is very high degree, then it has chance of being reached multiple, multiple times. So you need to discount that. And therefore, if d of u is very high, then I should output that, uh, appropriately discount that, and output that with lower probability. So the probability that you that get is 1 over du. In fact, you can show that formally. Uh, assume that the minimum degree of the graph is 1, just, just for uh, uh, analysis purposes. The claim is this algorithm takes t mix times d average number of steps to output a uniform node in the graph. So it's a product of two quantities, the average degree times the mixing time of the graph. And why is this true? Let's, the, the process, you know that you generate u according to the uh, distribution d1, which is proportional to the degree and you output u with probability 1 over du. So if you calculate the probability of outputting some node, it's just the uh, uh, union bound, so probability uh, that you output a particular node, and which is like probability of generating u equal to u, times the rejection probability. So you output only with probability 1 over du. And since the probability of u equal to u is exactly the d1 distribution, is d of u divided by 2 times the number of edges, if you work out the algebra, you get to be exactly 1 over the average degree. And therefore, the, the probability of outputting some node is 1 over average degree. So if you repeat this process, d average, the average degree times, then with a, a good probability, you'll output a sample. So the expected number of queries or the expected number of steps 
of this algorithm is d average times the t mix because you run for t mix times and you repeat this process d average times to get a one sample. Okay, which is a very very simple analysis. Okay, and the and the goal of this uh, uh, exercise is to see how good is this analysis. You know how uh, can you can this be improved at all? Here is one attempt to improve it. The intuition is that if the graph were uniform degree, if every node in the graph had the same degree, then outputting a random edge is actually equivalent to outputting a random node because you know that the degree of uh, a V is uh, some constant times, you know, uh, it's just some constant for all nodes. And therefore, if I output by standard uniform random work, then I'm essentially outputting a random uniform node. So how about we make the graph uniform by artificially slowing down the random walk, random walk at low degree nodes. So here is an example. So you have this example graph where the maximum degree is say three. And now at node B, you artificially add a self loop that keeps you at B with probability two thirds. So you kind of stay at B longer. So the advantage of doing this is that the effective maximum degree of this graph is actually three because every node you stay at typically three steps. And therefore, since you stay at node B for longer, it could be the case that you would query the graph fewer number of times. And that's the hope. Now, maybe this, this walk will result in querying this graph fewer number of times because you kind of hang out at the low degree nodes longer. So maybe that, that helps us. So first of all, we need to analyze this, uh, this process. So we have essentially taken the uh, uh, original uh, graph and we kind of modified it by adding self loops. Uh, the question is, how, uh, what is the expected number of queries on this modified graph? Okay. Now, first of all, it's easy to convince yourself that the steady state of this modified, I call it the max degree uh, uh, walk, is actually D0, which is the desired uniform distribution. So that's, that's an easy case. And you can say that the expected number of times you spend at a node is actually d max, the maximum degree divided by du. That's also easy to see because you added the appropriate you no know, weight to the uh, uh, appropriate extra weight to the low degree nodes. And we'll use a simple variational uh, kind of inequality, which relates the, the the complicated expression I put on the screen, to show that uh, the one minus lambda two, the the second eigenvalue, uh, the gap of the graph. Is actually related to the uh, uh, to the to the steady state of the of the walk, and using these simple relationships, you can show that the mixing time of this modified random walk is one over one minus lambda two times log n. And using all the stuff putting together, you can again show that the expected number of steps is actually O tilde because of this log n factors of the original quantity, the mixing time times the average degree. So what even though we have taken a more uh, complicated and intuitive route to uh, try to see if you can gain anything, it turns out that the expected number of steps is still the same as before. It's still the product of mixing time times the average degree. Okay. So what about, let's look at how a statistician think about it. So if you ask somebody, uh, uh, an undergrad in statistics, how would you do this problem? Uh, they'll immediately go to Metropolis Hastings. You know, it's a very, very classical, like, more than 50 years old method to actually generate uh, a sample according to any given distribution. In fact, it's a way to sample from any target distribution D starting from an arbitrary transition matrix Q. In this case, we'll assume that the transition matrix Q is actually given by the adjacent ma adjacency matrix of the graph. And the way Metropolis Hastings works, just a quick recap is that you're at a, at a state U, you first generate an, uh, a node V according to the uh, specified transition matrix that's using the uh, matrix Q. And you go from U to V with certain probability. The probability is uh, the Q of V U times D of U divided by Q of U V times D of V uh, capped at one. Okay. So this transition can be shown to achieve the desired distribution D. So basically, it's a way to transform any transition matrix Q to a given target distribution D. Think of that way. And in our case, our target distribution D is a uniform distribution. And uh, uh, the, the arbitrary transition matrix Q is our adjacency matrix. So you can work out the, uh, the Q and the D in this expression. And you can calculate that the probability of U 
uh, transition to V is exactly one over the maximum of the degrees of the endpoints, degree of U comma degree of V. And that turns out to be the Metropolis Hastings uh, transition distribution for achieving uniform uh, distribution. Okay. And what if we do Metropolis Hastings? So we can, we can work out the thing as before, and what we'll get is that the expected number of steps is actually T mix, the mixing time, times the maximum degree. And the proof is similar to what we did for maximum degree a walk. The important point to notice is that instead of average degree, you have maximum degree, which is, you know, we, we know that maximum degree is degree, in fact, I mean, in power law graphs is substantially more. This bound is worse than what uh, what you would be given by uh, max degree or rejection sampling. And in fact, this is not like a pessimistic bound. It's not a bound that's an artifact of analysis. You can construct the graphs such that the expected number of steps for uh, Metropolis Hastings is omega of this. So it's at least T mix times D max. And the construction is very simple. So you put a you put a clean say KD in the center of the, uh, the graph, and you put a lot of long paths, paths of length K from every of the nodes. And you can set up things such that, uh, so notice that in a path, the mixing time is like K squared, because you know, that's, a, that's a cover time for a path, and so you need to uh, touch all the nodes in the path, and that will take like K squared. And the fact that you have K different paths, and you have like a, a large things in the middle, uh, you can work out the details to uh, understand that you need at least T mix times D max to be able to actually see and uh, uh, touch all the nodes in this graph. Uh, and that gives us a lower bound for MH. If you work out the uh, uh, probabilities for MH, then this is the bound you'll get. Okay. So the, the bound we had, upper bound we had for MH is not uh, pessimistic. In fact, it's tight. So what this shows is that even though MH seems to be like a very natural way to uh, use random walks to achieve uniform distribution, it may not be the optimum to use. You, know, you have to be careful while uh, while designing algorithms uh, based on based on stuff like image. Okay, so now that we have argued that somehow we seem to be coming uh, uh, running into this barrier, right? We are running into the barrier of t mix times d average, and that seems uh, we are uh, no matter like whichever route we take, we seems to be we seem to be hitting that uh, wall all the time. So let's see. Let's try to see if this is actually uh, optimal. The first is that it's easy to show uh, an omega average degree bound. So the construction is you take a random uh, GNP graph with the average degree D, and then you add some randomness to that. So at every node, uh, with probability half and with probability one over D, you uh, 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 so sorry, you take GN, GNP as one instance, and you take another instance to be with uh, probability one over D at every node. You add a small tree. And you can see that these two uh, graphs have a um, uh, uh, huge distance, actually. Uh, if you want to generate uniform node among these two graphs, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly large. It's like half, because you know, uh, with probably one over D, you have, you're having like a, a, a tree of degree D. And you can calculate that the distance actually is quite big. However, if the graph uses little of D, little of the average degree, uh, to distinguish these two graphs, it's not possible because you'll never hit this. You know, uh, 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 you'll never hit this. Like uh, the vertices where you actually added this extra tree, so you can't distinguish these two instances by using a uh, little o of uh, average degree number of queries. And similarly, it's easy to see that t mix is actually a uh, lower bound because um, I mean, without mixing, you know, you cannot hope to get for even for regular graphs, you cannot hope to get uh, a uniform edge, let alone uniform node. So these two are uh, lower bounds. So the kind of lower bound you will get is D average plus T mix. But on the other hand, the upper bounds have, we have been having our D average times T mix. But it turns out that, uh, again, the upper bound, unfortunately, is tight. And this is like very recent result by uh, uh, Kerikati and Hadadan, which showed that any, al any algorithm to obtain an additive approximation of the average uh, 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 of any function of the boundary degree of the graph must uh, use D average times T mix number of queries. So basically, this is uh, the best you can do for any graph, uh, and there's no way around it. So that concludes the first part of my talk, which where the message was, uh, random walks are great, uh, but you have to be a little bit careful by selecting the right algorithm 
in order to even solve the very simple problem of outputting a uniform node in the graph. So if I choose MH, then, uh, uh, um, yeah, let me skip this construction. So the, if you choose MH, then you might run into uh, efficiency issues. And let me quickly go with experiments to con to convince you that this is actually not just theoretical uh, uh, artifact, but also observed in practice. Uh, so we have two kinds of way you can uh, test the whole thing. One is that I can uh, I can check how uniform the samples I get from this algorithms, or I can actually use the samples to do something else. Okay. For example, I can use the samples to estimate the size of the network or to compute clustering coefficient and so on. So we'll come to the come to these questions in the second part. So the I mean, experiments on like real graphs show that image is actually very bad. No, if you calculate the this the first part of the graph shows the the y-axis shows the L1 difference between the distribution you obtain versus a uniform distribution, and y, uh, the x-axis shows the number of queries you need to make to the graph. And you can see that image is really bad, but uh, the rejection sampling does pretty well, and so the the phenomenon exists for other graphs as well. And in fact, the same thing holds if you use the samples to uh, is, do like various uh, estimations, like the estimating the average degree, then still uh, reje re rejection sampling or MD, they do pretty well. Okay. So I've been using the symbols D0 and D1, and that's for a reason. So in fact, you can generate, you can define a very generic distribution, D of say one plus epsilon, where the goal is to output a node with, prob with, uh, uh, with mass say, uh, um, a degree of uh, uh, a degree of the uh, node times one plus epsilon. Okay, so I want to basically pick high degree nodes with say higher probability. Unfortunately, it turns out that you cannot do anything for this. You no, know? you cannot. The number of steps you will make is actually uh, polynomial in n, and that's because for the simple reason that if I amplify the degree like this, if I want to output uh, higher degree nodes with even with higher probability. They can, then I can always hide some really high degree nodes in the graph such that you have to basically look at the entire graph to be able to output that node. So there is uh, there is a trade-off here. So the D0 and D1 that we talked about are very special. And if you try to extend it to higher degree, then you run into this uh, uh, lower bound. So basically, you have to look at the entire graph. OK. So this is basically the, the first part of the talk where I try to motivate sampling as an important problem and uh, uh, generating a uniform node in the graph, even though it looks like a very simple problem, uh, is technically uh, quite uh, intricate because of uh, some pitfalls that one might face by using things like uh, metropolis statistics. OK. So the second part of the talk is the uh, more statistical part where suppose I have samples like this from D0 or D1. How would I use them to estimate interesting graph properties, once again using random box? Okay, so here is a very simple property. I want to count the number of nodes in the graph. So estimating n, very, very basic thing, right? So I want to know how big Twitter, Twitter graph is. And this has been considered extensively in our community, in the social networks and the web community. And the rough idea in most of the work is using birthday paradox. So if you have k uniform samples, then the expected number of collisions in this k samples is roughly k squared divided by n. Right, I expect like uh, if I have uh, uh, square root n samples, then I expect two of them to have the same birth rate. And using this as the basic tool, uh, Kardzer, Liberty, and Somek uh, propose the following simple algorithm. So you want to sample propor nodes proportional to the degree, and if uh, x1 through xk are the samples, then you output uh, this quantity, which is sum of some sum of the degrees of the samples divided uh, times sum of the reciprocal degrees. The whole thing divided by the number of collisions. And why why I'm insisting on the first bullet? Why sample nodes proportional degree? Because that's something that we really like. Because that's exactly what a uh, random walk would achieve. So instead of uh, as I argued, getting uniform nodes is very hard, but getting uniform edges is relatively easy. And therefore, if I sample nodes proportional to degree, which can be achieved by random walk, I get uniform edges. And this quantity that they output, you can show that. Uh, is related to the expected number of collisions. The expected number of collisions in this graph is exactly k choose 2 times the, uh, uh, the, the, the di over m squared. OK. And in fact, you can, uh, you can do something slightly sharper analysis, actually. So even though this is very, looks very pessimistic, 
if the if the graph is say regular then you can show that square root and sample suffice or if the graph is say has a power law with parameter 2 then even fewer sample suffices into the one fourth suffice actually so by making even more assumptions on the degree distribution you can get uh, sharper and better uh, bounds on the number of samples you need for estimating number of collisions and there was some follow up work uh, by cooper and uh, et al who used uh, return times of the random walks to do even better estimates so right now we just use random walks in a, a black box manner but if i also estimate the amount of time it takes for a random walk to return to a given node then i can get even better estimates the question we turn to is actually average degree so this is uh, estimating number of nodes is very simple and in fact uh, the motivation for this was actually when i was talking to my friend who works for linkedin i asked him uh, i know how big is linkedin uh, tell me how many uh, what is the average degree of linkedin and he came back with the answer saying that sorry i can't tell you it's like a business secret and that actually motivated uh, us to look at this problem uh, from an algorithmic point of view so if i were to access linkedin uh, as a crawl, how can I use that to estimate the average degree? Okay. So average degree, I mean the number of edges divided by number of nodes. So first of all, there's a very simple answer to that. I can uh, estimate n and m independently using collision counting. So I can estimate the average degree using order root m plus order root n time. It's the number of samples. Or I can even do using directly, actually using uh, node collisions. Turns out that that gives you a bound of square root of n times some uh, average degree quantities. Okay, so basically you are stuck at square root n. And in fact, here is a very natural algorithm to output the average degree of a graph. You sample nodes in the graph uniformly at random. You output the average of the degrees. Okay? That's a very very natural algorithm, right? You you pick a uniform node in the graph and uh, output uh, the average degree that you see. And let's forget for the moment that. Uniform uh, nodes is hard, but even if, even if like we have access to that, here is that this is a natural algorithm. And Figer proved in a, a beautiful result that if the number of samples is square root of n divided by some bound that depends on the average degree, then this algorithm gives you a two plus epsilon estimate of the uh, average degree. And you might ask, why does it give you two plus epsilon estimate? It's natural because there's no way around it. Now think of the graph in this example on the right hand side, the top graph. So unless this uniform sample hits the blue node, I cannot distinguish this graph from a graph consisting of you know just disjoint edges. Because in the, this graph has a lower average degree. Uh, sorry, sorry, this is a higher average degree. The other one has average degree one. So to distinguish these two things, I need to really see this uh, blue, blue node. Therefore, any algorithm that uses little o of n, say square root n samples, will never see this blue node, and therefore it will give you only a factor two approximation away. Okay. And in fact, you cannot. This is this is basically what you can do. You can you can get only factor two plus epsilon approximation, and you have to use square root n samples. And there are there are obvious there are uh, uh, good lower bounds for that. So there are limitations of this algorithm. And, and Goldreich and Ron proposed a slightly different estimator where they try to bucket the sample nodes by degrees and they kind of throw out the small degree, uh, small buckets because they contribute to higher variance. So they compromise on the uh, unbiasedness of the estimator and still they only get two plus epsilon approximation. And if they make an additional assumption that for every node you have a random neighbor that's available, then you can get a one plus epsilon approximation. But still the number of samples is the square root n. So basically, we seem to be running into this barrier of square root n. So um, the square root n from the naive collision counting or through a Figes method or through Goldreich-Ron. And that seems to be like a, a barrier that we are not able to overcome to estimate the average degree. And in fact, uh, as I said, any uniform sampling algorithm cannot will face this lower bound. So you have a sample lower bound of square root n for any uniform sampling algorithm. Okay. But now that we've argued random walks are really good, what about non-uniform sampling? What about uh, if you try to use uh, nodes picked according to a random walk, say degree biased? Okay, we have to be, uh, again, this may not uh, give a good answer because look at the example that uh, on the right hand side, okay? So the top uh, uh, set of nodes um, have a, a very low average degree because there is a huge component that has like average degree zero. And the bottom uh, example has average degree of say three. Say let's let's call it n over four regular. Okay. 
So it's average degree of n over 4. But if you just use random walks, on the top graph, you will never see these uh, isolated components, like you no know, single terms. Therefore, you think that the average degree of this graph is actually different from the bottom one. So you have to be careful. So you can't just say take uh, random walks and use the uh, samples from the random walks to estimate average degree. So you will uh, you kind of uh, give too much importance to high degree nodes. You will never take into account low degree nodes. And that's the that's the uh, that's the intuition here. So uniform random walks are very bad for high degree nodes because you end up uh, uh, not taking high degree nodes into account properly. And degree bias nodes, uh, degree bias sampling like random walks are bad for low degree nodes because you never see them. Okay. And the question is, can we get the best of both worlds? Can we get the best of uniform random walks and the degree bias nodes and do something better asymptotically for this problem? And here is the idea. So instead of sampling nodes uh, uniformly or sampling nodes proportional degree, you sample nodes with probability proportional to degree plus a small constant, a smoothing constant. So that's, that's the paradigm that uh, I'm trying to promote. And notice that this, this node of sampling is still random walk friendly because I can do some kind of a lazy random walk. I can still do a random walk, but I add this constant to make the random walk say stay a little bit longer at every node similar to the uh, similar to the max degree walk that, that we talked before and the only interesting question is how do you choose this constant carefully because uh, poor choice of constant might for example the constant at say a zero is bad because you know it's, it'll be like degree bias or constant very high will make the walk uniform and that's also bad so there has to be some sweet spot between these two that hopefully will give us an asymptotic improvement to the number of samples Okay. That's, the, that's the idea here. So the algorithm will actually involve three steps. Uh, it's, it's like a bootstrapping algorithm. So first, it does it estimates uh, what is called a coarse estimator, where the goal of the estimator to get a constant approximation to the average degree. So think of like a, a factor 12 approximation to the average degree. And then there's a bootstrapping step that takes this constant approximation and makes it arbitrarily small. So it's, we call it the refined estimator. So it takes this constant and makes it like a one plus epsilon. So the algorithm is just putting these things together. You first run the coarse estimator, get an estimate, a very crude estimate of the average degree, and then use that estimate as the smoothing constant and run the refined estimate. Okay, that's the whole uh, algorithm. Okay. So first let me talk about the refined estimator uh, because it's easier. Um, and what is what is what are we given? We are given some course estimate C. Uh, think of C as a constant. What we do is that we sample k nodes x1 through xk with probability proportional to the degree plus this constant C. And that's I argued it's easy to do using a random walk. And then the output of uh, uh, these two quantities, the ratio of these two quantities, A and B, where A is di over di plus C and B is 1 over di plus C. And you can calculate that the expected value of A divided by the expected value of B is exactly equal to the average degree. Notice that you can't say much about the, uh, I mean, it's not the case that it's you're looking at E of A or B. In fact, it's the uh, numerator and denominator treated separately, and the average values of both will give you the average degree. And that's actually quite important because it says that this estimator is actually biased. It's, I'm sorry, it's not unbiased. It's not that we uh, average these estimators and get average degree. Okay. okay. And how do you prove that? So it, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. So if suppose the C, the crude estimator that you got is some uh, uh, constant factor away from average degree, say it's alpha times average degree. And if the number of samples is something like one over alpha divided, divided by epsilon squared, then you can show that the refined estimator outputs a uh, one plus epsilon estimate. And the way to show is that these two quantities, A and B, the numerator and denominator, are concentrated given this value of k. And uh, you can analyze the second moment and use Bernstein's inequality to show that the concentration happens. And in fact, the denominator needs a coarse estimate. The denominator is fine, but the denominator is actually, you have to be careful. Remember, the denominator is something like this, 1 over uh, di plus c. And that requires the estimator to be good. OK. And you can show that the uh, uh, the deviation b minus expected value of b is less than 2 over uh, uh, something related to the minimum degree and the estimate. Okay. 
and as i said this is actually not an unbiased estimator and but you can bound the bias you can see the bias you can calculate the biases at most something uh, related to the estimate and the average degree and if the estimate is good then it's uh, it's bounded and uh, as i said this you can implement this algorithm as a random walk and the number of samples you uh, you need for the random walk is related to the eigen value gap of the of the graph that again you can work it out it's fairly easy now we'll come to the coarse estimator so remember the fine estimator refined estimator assume that you already have uh, a constant approximation to the average degree but how do you get that in the first place and that uh, that uses a guess and verify paradigm so you first guess you first guess in logarithmic buckets you choose c equal to 1 2 4 8 and so on and you sample nodes with probability proportional to degree plus c that again we know you can do easily using random walks and now you calculate the number of low degree nodes okay if the fraction of low degree nodes is more than say some 5 over 12 then you stop and say that this c that corresponds to that uh, uh, to that experiment is my coarse estimator and why does it work? That works uh, using some version of uh, Markov inequality. You can show that if C is something like alpha times average degree, then uh, the probability that a particular uh, node has uh, a degree less than or equal to C is bounded on both sides by this function of alpha. And therefore, if C is uh, uh, very small, then the a fraction of low degree nodes is less than 5 over 12. And if C is an overestimate, uh, is, sorry, is an underestimate, then the fraction of nodes, the low degree nodes is large. And therefore, by uh, since you have bones on both sides, by just trying C one by one, we will, uh, by using the right criterion, we'll output the appropriate value of C, which is fine. I mean, all we care about is like factor three, right? So we'll get a factor three approximation to the average degree from this. And that's the entire algorithm. So this is the final bound. So the final bound is that you can estimate uh, the average degree with say probability one minus uh, delta by using log u log log u plus one over epsilon squared queries, where u is some upper bound on the maximum degree. You can take u to be the maximum degree. But the point to note here is that maximum degree is less than n, and therefore you get log n log log n number of samples. And contrast that against the uh, earlier algorithm, which all took root n. So basically, and even in fact, there was even a lower bound, right? So you can't do better than root n, but we are able to get around that lower bound uh, of uniform samples by using uh, degree bias samples. That's the point of this. So you can get exponential improvement. You can get almost like log n, log log n number of samples. And it's not just theory, but also in practice. You can show that uh, uh, this random walks uh, do obtain uh, better estimates of the average degree than using Figer or Goldreich uh, Ron algorithms actually. So they not only they do well in theory, but also well in practice. So it's a, it's a strict improvement. Okay. Okay, so that basically concludes uh, my talk. So here's a summary. So the message that I want to convey is that random box are, are really powerful. They can go much beyond page rank to uh, estimate uh, other interesting properties of graph like uh, um, average degree or generating uniform node. And we showed there are interesting bounds on generating uniform node. Uh, you can extend that to other distributions on V. And one has to be careful using random walks for this purpose, because if I use a wrong random walk, like in Metropolis Hastings, then uh, I can get uh, uh, strictly worse results, both in theory and in practice. And maybe this points out to this line of thinking also points out to maybe there are better notions of mixing for social graphs. You know, uh, maybe lambda two or the mixing time is probably not the go not the right notion for such graphs. Maybe there are like average case notions that are more appropriate. Uh, maybe like one is willing to discard large fractions of the graph uh, in order to define a, like a mixing time. Maybe that's a that's a better notion. And second uh, thing I wanted to say is that there is a lot of power in random walks in that they give rise to non-uniform sampling of the nodes. And that can lead to uh, better algorithms, say, even for a simple problem like average degree. And the question is, can this idea of non-uniform sampling be used for other estimation problems uh, in order to improve their bounds? Now, there are so many other estimation problems one can think of in the graph, like, like number of triangles or clustering coefficient, things like that. Uh, do these non-uniform samples on particular random walks, can they give rise to uh, improved upper bounds by uh, circumventing the lower bounds that already exist.
So that's all I have. Uh, any questions, please uh, reach out to me on my Gmail. Once again, I apologize for not being there. Uh, it looked like a fun workshop. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Can you get it? Oh, one second. Can you see me? Uh, no, you don't, we don't see you. We see our... One second. Can you see me now? So, uh, are there questions? So, you mentioned uh, re uh, return times. Right. Can you discuss uh, situations when uh, you have, like, Poincaré recurrences, power law distribution, or you will have uh, always on this graph exponential distribution of return times? So, I, I'm not fully aware of the line of work. So, the return time work of the work of Cooper et al. was actually, I think, more on the theoretical side. I don't know how much has it been used in practice or in, like, stylized models, but that the the thing that I want to convey is that in addition to just random walks, you can also use some things that come out of the random walks, like the return times, in order to do some estimation. So I, I don't know much about the uh, you know, the Poincaré occurrences or graph exponential work. Because in dynamical systems, this chaos and uh, ha chaotic and integrable components, it's rather generic that you have power law distribution of uh, return times. I because see. you can have sticking near some islands of stability. And then I, I wonder if your estimates will work uh, for such situations. It's also a directed network. So the directed networks are very tricky because, you know, I, I mean, the lambdas, I like, I mean, you might get stuck in some local uh, uh, regions and then typically there are, they will have like, some of them will have a huge exponential mixing time. So I don't know how many of them will work in uh, directed settings. So. You may have to repeat the question. Uh, yeah, there is a question of Sergei. And what about the non-backtracking and works? What is about non-backtracking? Uh, non non-backtracking works. So these works are not. These works are non-backtracking. These are like regular random works. They are uniform random works. Actually, yeah, that's a that's a very good direction uh, 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 because. If you had allowed backtracking, maybe you can improve some of the bounds even further. I mean, I, I don't know how to analyze them, but it's it's a it's a good direction actually to uh, to study. Okay. Any other questions? No. Then okay. Thanks, Yuraya. <laughs>